This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. Please note that this podcast will have spoilers. In this chat, we will discuss the underlying themes, historical influences, inspirations, technology, ethical dilemmas, and other inspirational insights we have gleaned from each episode of the first season of Mr. Robot. We will be bringing on experts to share their insights and knowledge with us in each chat. We will also be reviewing each episode of the first season, as well as the second season season when it premieres. We are awake, we are free, we are alive for F Society IRC Podcast. Hello F Society IRC chat, uh, this is your moderator from the Shai, and we are going to review Roger Fong. This episode uh, was a fantastic episode, I think it progressed the overall season art uh, well. I liked a lot of the developments that were going on, particularly a lot of the character developments. We got a significant insight into the FBI agent Dom, as well as White Rose. We also got a lot of insight into some of the motivations for Angela. And we saw Darlene, you know, showcase uh, her social engineering skills, if you will, this episode. But we're going to begin. I'm going to break this up into three parts. We're going to do Elliot, and then we're going to do Angela and Darlene together. And then we're going to be um, Dawn and White Rose. So let's begin with Elliot, our main protagonist. He is finally back on the computer, which is super exciting. I like how they filmed it because they filmed it like he was like in the zone as he's actually for the first time really talking to his friends, the audience, about what it is he was doing, which was uh, using some zero day exploits on the Android phones, which is the standard phones that the FBI uses, and uh, combining. Uh, this program, this script program that he developed, this logic bomb, with a hardware device called the Fintel Cell, he and F Society will be, will be able to own all the FBI phones on the 23rd floor, and therefore getting some insight into the investigation to, into the F9 hack. Uh, it kind of gives a little bit of his history about how he got into hacking. Uh, he started when he was 11 years old, uh, getting into the Washington Township Library Servers. Um, his motivation primarily was just to see if he could do it, but also because he had uh, some open to shrines, which I found really amazing. And he talked about like the godlike feeling he had just by being able to peek through and just look around and be able to own things. Um, how they filmed it is they like, darkened the room, which allowed for like a primary focus on Elliot, the character, but also what it did was when he got interrupted, it kind of like allowed for the audience to be like taken out at the same time as Elliot uh, for what he was doing because the room brightened up and what brightened up and it just showed, it kind of showcased how versus last season where the, the cinematography was very dark a lot of the episode took place at night this episode is taking place or this season I should say is taking place during the day it's a little bit brighter even though a lot of the storylines and the story arc that went on have been very dark it's been a very well lit and very well, um, almost kind of bubble gummy com- compared to last seasons. Uh, the cinematography, or the way they're filming, uh, setting, if you will. So Elliot is developing this program that he's going to give to Darlene um, when he meets up. Before he does that, he tells the henchman that's been watching over him that he needs to talk to Ray, or in fact, actually talk to the old IET guy to get gain access. To some encrypted information that's on the server so he can migrate over to it. And the henchman um, states that he will do that for him. So Elliot meets Darlene. Um, she basically tells him that they need to utilize Angela. Uh, we'll talk about that for himself because she did meet uh, Angela before she met Elliot. Uh, an interesting thing was that uh, Darlene said, Where's the she devil? Very forceful. Um, kind of emphasizing that her mother is there. Um, they talk about you know how they should, she wants to use Angela and he was very against it. He he doesn't want anything to do, anything to do with what's going on. And Darlene was like, "There's no other way. It's a fortress to get its corp And you know, basically, Angela is the only one who has you know the best access. Uh, Mister Robot supports the idea of using Angela, but Elliot is very against it, and he's actually quite forceful. It's the first time we've seen Elliot himself be forceful as a his own personal persona versus the Mr. Robot persona and he tells Angela to find a way to get it done. He did his part 
now she needs to do hers. So they're a bit of a disagreement on how to enact the, the Femtel FBI hack. And then Elliot meets with Ray, and Ray asks him why does he need to, you know, this gain access, if you will, to the to the servers. And Elliot basically says, you know, it's, it's the only way. I need I need access. I need to talk to this guy so I can do what needs to be done. And Ray was like, Well, I thought you were the best. And Elliot was like, I am the best, but this is how it needs to be done. And uh, Ray's there with his dog and petting the dog. And Elliot asks about the dog, but Ray kind of ignores the question about the health of the dog, which kind of looks like the dog is not doing so well. Um, you know, Ray's kind of taking care of it, and she's just kind of laying down on the ground like she's she's sick or you will. And um, it was very interesting considering that Ray seems to be very open about the dog and very open about to Elliot, who will about things that he wouldn't answer those questions. But Ray says that he'll make it happen. So later on, we see. Um, Elliot meet up with Angela, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit when we talk about Angela and Garlic Darnie's storyline. But what I found very fascinating, and this is the part I'm going to take about it that deals with um, Elliot particularly, was that Angela is very empathetic to Elliot's situation. She understands kind of why he's there. Uh, he kind of breaks it down to her that, you know, even though she's made these overtures towards him, that he didn't want anything to do with her because basically, as he said, you know, I see my dead father right behind you. And then Angela, she she turns as almost as if he was really there or not to kind of almost acknowledge to Elliot that she's, she's acknowledging that he has this problem, this issue. And Elliot's basically saying that he wanted to be well, well enough to, to be with someone like Angela, I guess. And Angela's like, well, since that's not the case now, that she's willing to be his friend, that she will be the friend that he needs to be, and that she cares about about him and he needs that person in his life. And if you think about it, besides Darlene, there's really not a really tremendous active person in Elliot's life. I mean, he's a bit of a loner. He does talk to Krista, but Krista is a, a counselor. She's not a friend. He probably does be somebody else, someone else besides Mr. Robot and us, the audience, to talk to and speak about his problems and his woes. And I know he has been talking to Ray, but you know, Ray's conversations are very guarded, and I think if they were to develop it, I think it would really not only help Elliot as a person, but maybe help him gain complete access of himself, if you will, if you think of him as a software program or a hardware device where he can have complete control of himself, complete control of the program, that if someone like Angela was there to help him to assist him to do that. So they meet, and Angela agrees that she is going to be the one that's going to go into the building, that she's going to be the one to um, put the fence cell down and to enact the program. She's going to do this for them. Elliot meets RT, and they're working on the site in Ray's office. He's talking to RT on the type pad, and RT doesn't want to talk about it. He, he's like, don't you know what the site is about? Don't you know what things are going on here? And Elliot was like, no, you know, how bad is it? And RT type writes, tour him site, invite only, difficult to get account, do the map. And that's when Mr. Robot shows up again. Um, Mr. Robot throughout the whole Elliot arc has not been that prominent besides the visit of Angela and Darlene. He, you can say he almost been in the shadows, if you will. Been from the very get-go against the whole Ray alliance. But Elliot was like, well, this is what you wanted. You wanted me on a terminal, which he is. You wanted me to do this, so this is the only way to do it. And, you know, Elliot can't help himself, you know, he has to scratch that itch. And the RT guy, the IT guy, shows him the site, and it's pretty awful. It has, like, human trafficking, hitmen, um, drugs, of course, all sorts of kind of stuff. And the guy types in the password to get in, and it's Dread Pirate Roberts, which is which makes Ray the, the architect, if you will, the... Much like the Silk Road guy, I guess they can make they're making that comparison here within the Mr. Robot world. And so Elliot is looking at the site and he's, you know, a little freaked out. It's pretty hardcore stuff, it's pretty awful stuff. And it conflicts with his entire mindset that he's had with Ray and he's trying to figure it out as he's in his room, you know. What kind of person is Ray? does he have two sides like Elliot does? 
I mean, is he a protective, caring person, or is he this, you know, awful person that allows these things to happen? Does Ray even know what's on the site? And Mr. Robot tells him to forget what he's doing, to stop looking. And Elliot is saying, you're being selfish. You're in Mr. Robot is arguing with Elliot that this guy is not a, you know, a coffee guy like from the beginning of, uh, the season premiere from, uh, season one, the episode one, where he took down that guy from the coffee shop that was running the, uh, kitty porn site. You know, Ray's different. He's a different type of a, a villain, if you will. And Elliot can't just destroy him. Things are going to get in a bad. And Elliot was like, you know, no, I, I can't sit by and allow this to happen. And, you know, that's the, kind of the end of the conversation. Elliot's made up his mind that he's going to stop Ray, if you will. And this has kind of been Elliot's problem. This is what got, gets him in trouble quite a bit on the show is that he, you know, he puts his cape on. He tries to be the superhero. I mean, that's what he started F society in the first place is he wanted to save the world. Uh, he tried to save Shayla and she ended up getting killed. Uh, he tried to end up helping Krista and end up basically destroying that bond of relationship with that person. Um, he tried to help Angela within All Safe at that meeting and she ended up getting kicked out of the meeting. You know, he, he tries to do things, he tries to fight these battles, if you will. Uh, even if you look at the 5-9 hack and what has happened with the people outside in the world with the $50 allowance, uh, the businesses folding, people not knowing or being sure if they own their own homes or own their own property, if you will, you know, Elliot is very much responsible for that. So Elliot, you know, gets picked up by uh, Ray's goon somehow in the middle of the night and starts getting beat up. And he looks at Ray pleading as Ray comes out of his van and Ray tells him that he shouldn't have looked. And... That's pretty much the end of Elliot's storyline there. It's, it seems that he's been scooped up by Ray's guys, and they're taken away, um, removing him from his mom's house to some other unknown location to obviously keep him for some other purpose to continue the work on the site, but in a way that's not going to get, I guess, everybody in trouble, if you will, or have Elliot somehow, you know, tell or narc on them, if you will, which, which is what Elliot's going to do, so it's smart on their part. Trying to scoop them up. So Dom's storyline is, is very crucial to the progression of the overall of season two, I think. Uh, I'm going to, the American portion of it, I'm just going to kind of go through real quick. It turns out the FBI does, has found the Raspberry Pi responsible for taking down Steel Mountain. Uh, Dom reveals as she visits the FBI site on the 23rd floor that there's a very lax security. That's why uh, F Society feels that they can actually penetrate that floor and gain access and, and own the FBI phones. Uh, she gets an email, or I should say there's an office email indicating that they're going to go to China to find out how the Chinese are coming along with their investigation into the, the F9 hack. Dom kind of reveals that she, you know, throws up our planes. Uh, she's talking with her uh, partner, if you will, who's a uh, female partner that she that's also one of the names that was on the list that Lenoro had. And it turns out her boss, Santiago, is one of the FBI units is also that name on that list. And we met uh, at the FCI of Kate. So they go to China, and as Dom is coming out of the deep planning, if you will, and coming into the Chinese airport, she sees two men in the dark on mass. And then she meets with her counterparts, and it turns out that White Rose in her civilian role is a Chinese security administrative head, and he's responsible and he's heading up the F9 investigation on the Chinese side. So it kind of reveals a little bit about his position and his connection, if you will, in the civilian role, and how he has a, a part, if you will, to play not only in the F Society hack as being the leader of the Dark Army, but his, a little bit to his connection to Philip Price. So they talked about, you know, in this meeting they talked about how there was going to be, um, that they already just visited the escorted uh, backup sites, um, and that site was not uh, taken down by climate control like Steel Mountain, but it was Bigaz, which is very interesting, because Bigaz was basically taking a, a magnet, if you will, to a computer device and just erasing everything, some kind of electro electromagnetic pulse. It's kind of similar to the fashion that Elliot did last season, he took his SIM cards and he nuked them in, in the microwave to prevent anybody from uh, finding out info, any information on them. And also important it was to find out that there's also four backup sites in China. So the Dark Army has a significant amount of reach. They had the time to be gods, 
um, all the servers in these backup sites would be doing at five sites all at the same time. The other important information there was that the encrypted eCorp servers were also on the uh, Chinese side, which is a question that we weren't sure was uh, was the case. We knew the American side was uh, encrypted because of Elliot. He indicated he encrypted the information, but now we know that the Chinese side is encrypted. And so the question becomes, who owns the keys to the encrypted server? Is it just Elliot? Is it a split between White Rose and Elliot? Is, does White Rose have the keys to the American side and he has the keys to the Chinese side? Does nobody have the access to encrypt the keys? Uh, it'd be interesting to see what the deal with, is with that because if we, as we talked about before, all the episode names, uh, the ending code, if you will, has to do with encryption. And the fact that the eCorp servers have been encrypted, both on the Chinese and American sites is very interesting, and I'm not sure how that's going to play into the whole theory that we talked about in um, the theories episode about China trying to take the American um, economy through the Dark Army, that the Dark Army is a sponsored Chinese hacking group by the Chinese government, because if you're the Chinese government and you have the keys to the eCorp servers, the number one global financial provider in the world, I would think not taking the economy would be the way to control it. I would think it would be the outright takeover or some kind of blackmail or deal, something that would be less advantageous or confrontational than the tempting the economy, if you will, that is occurring right now. So I think it kind of leaves up in the air on whose side White Rose is truly on. I'm sure it's going to be just, you know, White Rose is just on her own side, but whether or not the Dark Army is actually really working for or with the Chinese government. But in this meeting as well, um, Don blurts out about how they need access to the, the Dark Army files, because after all, they're a known hacking group. They they might potentially have been involved in this. And White Rose just kind of gives her, like, the, the death stare, if you will, uh, a look of chagrin or just I, I'm not sure how you can categorize that look because uh, it was just it was just such a I would say death stare and then she smiles and she says you know we'll, we'll be happy to hand over those particular files and then she states that on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Shark is going to be uh, the continuation of the escorted escorts around the sites uh, the four sites that we now know to be five sites in total uh, in China. But on Monday night, there's going to be a party and they're all invited to a home. So Dom goes to this home, goes to this, you know, basically a uh, employee meeting. Uh, she's bored out of her mind. She ends up talking to her colleague, one of the other colleagues that is on the list that Romero had. Um, the list, by the way, that has her boss, Santiago, uh, who's the head of her department, if you will, uh, her female partner, and this guy that she's talking to, uh, um, who's kind of acting like an ugly American. He, he actually refers to the Chinese as, uh, who would say, barbarians or savages, if you will, because they didn't have General, General So's chicken. Just, ugh. Just very ugly American, if you will. So Dom kind of leaves him starts wandering around in the party and ends up finding a room that's filled with clocks. And the clocks all say 11.50 and she's just walking around and staring and she ends up staring at this one particular clock and then White Rose walks in and says, uh, do you have the time? This scared the crap out of me when she uh, spoke to Dom. And of course, scared the crap out of Dom. And um, Dom being an awkward person, you know, it says she was just a little, little girl from and everything like that. And then she just goes straight into, you know, what's with the clocks? And, um, Don go, you know, White Rose goes into a whole quote from Macbeth about, uh, morality and time. And Don basically, you know, jumps to the conclusion that White Rose surrounds herself with the reminders of morality that, you know, every moment counts. 
and they started getting into conversations. They talked about the clock that Don was uh, looking at, and she said that she had a similar clock, or grandparents actually had a similar clock on their wall. And right, well, Rose tells her that he was assured by uh, the salesperson in Germany that that was kind, and they kind of both have a bit of a laugh about it. She goes, you know, so much for the businessman. So Don is talking to White Rose and then ends up going further into White Rose's personal space, if you will. And uh, Don, uh, White Rose wanted to show her a portrait and starts talking about um, revolution and art and how this particular piece that he was examining, um, many in China don't particularly agree with it, but the people really love it. And they start talking about revolution and how they're talking revolutionaries that you know, have a desire for destruction and how revolution and art kind of go hand in hand. And then White Rose asked a very personal question about, you know, why she got into the FBI was, was the story there. And Dom was like, you know, that's really kind of personal. And, she, and White Rose is like, that's why I'm asking. And so Dom goes in this story about basically how she was in the last year of law school and she was about to be proposed to or she was proposed to by her significant other. Um, and then she excused herself from the table and just went to the restroom and walked out the back and never looked back. And some years later, here she is in the FBI. Uh, she's, you know, kind of attracted to the, to the whole concept that she's very much against the selfish brutality of man, but she's fascinated by the subject and works with the FBI. Um, what I found very interesting about her story when she revealed how she got into the FBI was that um, she never said he went down or she went down. She kind of never stated that. And I thought that was very telling because most time when people tell about the proposal stories, they always use, you know, the nomenclature that he and him, you know, his or her or she. And, um, she never stated that. She avoided that, that turn of phrase, if you will. So, so now we we have the next day, if you will, and Dom is meeting down with her her colleague colleagues for the Tuesday nine a.m. sharp meeting for the escorted uh, tours, if you will, of the other four sites. She's talking to her female companion, the FBI agent, is also on the list that she's on. Uh, they're coming down. They're talking about where their boss is. He's up in the room yelling about the Raspberry Pi that was found at Steel Mountain slash Steel Valley. Apparently, the person who found it, fat fingers were smudged, and he's a little bit infuriated. They kind of laugh about it. Dom tells her tells her colleague that she was, um, during the party, she was talking to the minister, uh, Young, which is the name, uh, White Rose's civilian name, and was shown to her sister's bedroom, but it turns out that the minister doesn't have a sister. And so they have a bit of a chuckle about that, and... Then two gunmen with machine guns enter and start killing the FBI team. Um, Dom's companion dies pretty much immediately, shot in the head. Uh, you can see in the background a number of other FBI agents were shot, including uh, the ugly American is also on the list. Uh, Dom turns around and goes and hides for cover. Another FBI agent gets taken down. She grabs his gun. Apparently she doesn't have a gun of her own. Shoots one of the gunmen in the leg. He uh, about to shoot him again, but he turns around and basically shoots himself in the head. And then the second machine gunman comes around the corner, and that's the end of Dom's story. So this is what I really liked about it. Um, one, they revealed um, the nature of White Rose, her position, if you will, in the 1% world, her position to the Chinese government. Um, that the E-Corp servers in China were also encrypted. That there not only was this uh, a deliberate takedown of the FBI team, but this was probably most likely done by the Dark Army. Whether or not it had the blessing of the FBI, or not the FBI, but the uh, Chinese government remains to be seen. I think that there was a, a number of purposes as it was done. One was to probably, no doubt, um, curtail the FBI investigation on the Chinese end, if you will, into the Dark Army, or possibly any kind of Chinese connection to the 5-9 five, five, hack. I also think that this delay may, in fact, impact um, any 
positions that have been made on the part of E Corp will probably no doubt affect the American economy even further because this is almost like a kind of a terrorist attack, if you will. I do believe Dom is going to live. I think we've seen, you know, the we've seen previews of her when they first talked about this season that she's a, she's been around. She's going to be around for a while. Of what state she's going to be in, who knows at this point. Uh, the other thing is, I think this this shows just how not practical I will say but how very smart Dom is I mean, she can just read people she's very good at reading people much of the way that Elliot is able to read people he finds a way to exploit human nature I think Dom does the same thing but I think she's more compassionate and more passionate about it maybe that was the reason why uh, White Rose kind of revealed a certain aspect of herself this very hidden aspect of herself to Dom then again, maybe she did it because she knew Don was going to die the following day. Who knows? But it basically progressed things further here on the storyline. As far as where basically the FBI, the Dark Army, and F Society are all going to start intersecting, in, I think, in a more direct manner. And somewhere in the mix, I think we're going to see a bit more of Philip Price's e-coin or at least e-corp's effort to get their, their bailout. But on to the final part of the, of the show. So now for the final part of the episode. Um, this episode is, you know, I'm going to combine, you know, not only Angela and, Dar and Darlene, but a little bit about Joanne. Basically, Joanne had the parking attendant guy whacked. Um... Whatever story that she has him telling to the FBI, he he's already told it, but he's panicking about it. He thinks he's being watched. Uh, she ends up meeting with him, even though they're not supposed to meet. He uh, tells her his phones are being tapped. He feels he's being watched at work, being watched at home. She kind of thanks him for letting her know about this and that she's going to take care of it. And she does by having the bodyguard that she has, the Taiwan Wellex bodyguard, which apparently online he's referred to as Mr. Sutherland, which um, if you go back, to, and I, I looked up why he's called that, if you go back to the season premiere, he his conversation of, to Elliot, he said, you know, refer to me as Mr. Sutherland. The conversation about JFK and how Elliot has never seen uh, the JFK movie, if you will. And... She was very cold-blooded about this, uh, what Joanne did. She basically said, you know, she basically had Mr. Sutherland give her the details of how this guy died. She ordered him to paralyze the man. Uh, Mr. Sutherland made it look like it was a B and E. Uh, she's singing a nursery rhyme at the time, and they're having this conversation to her son. Uh, he kills the guy, Kareem, uh, makes it look like a B and E from a guy that's from his building as a felon and takes his cash, shoots him once in the head, once in the chest with his own gun. Um, it was a pretty detailed inscription. And Mr. Southern asks, you know, why paralyze the guy? He says, pretty simple, I could have just shot him in the head and that would be the end of it. And Joanne was like, no, he needed to have answers before he died. He needed to know the reason why. And she asked him, did he look at you while you while you did it? And he goes, yeah. And she goes, see, here's a man who knew the reason and the purpose for his death, why he was being paralyzed and why he was being killed. And because he knew these answers upon leaving, I guess, this world to the next, then it's okay. It means that she and he are not like these senseless murderers, or if you will. This is this weird, bizarre logic that she had about not only having this guy killed, but basically the purpose and the reason. And it just ups the level of, I don't know what you want to say, the level of psychosis or sociopathic tendencies that Joanne has. Which means that if Tywell Wellick is dead, if that theory turns out to be true, her reaction to it, the whole matter is going to be ballistic. It's, it's not going to be good for Elliot and F Society because she knows already that Elliot is somehow tied to her husband and it might be it would be responsible for his death if that is true. So there's that. And if it turns out he's 
alive, then she's taking these very extraordinary steps to either, I don't know, cover up his tracks for him or making it so possible for him to come back to her. Because it's obvious that she still loves him. Um, she did receive uh, a packet that has like a, a, um, a child's rattler, a silver rattler that Mr. Sutherland uh, looked into as he was talking about um, Kareem's death. Uh, where They weren't able to trace the origin of the packet. Uh, she does receive a phone call later on in the evening, uh, which kind of ends her storyline. Uh, and she hears a bunch of breathing and possibly it's very faint. There might have been a voice, a Taiwa Wallach's voice on it. She's, you know, she's talking to him, asking him to come to her. Where are you? Uh, she can hear sirens um, in the phone as well as um, at her place. So she knows he's somewhere outside. She starts running out the door to kind of look for him. Um, but he's nowhere to be about, and the, the phone call ends. So I don't know if that phone call came onto the phone that she already received, um, the hidden phone, if you will. Um, it could is a possibility, but again, I think the whole purpose of this storyline, or this particular viewpoint, if you will, is that she's you know a dedicated wife seeking to get her husband back, but also that if he is dead, then pff, F Society needs to watch his back basically. So now we're into the Angela and Darlene. Um, when we meet Angela, she, well actually both Angela and Darlene, Darlene is in Angela's uh, place and she's putting some type of program on a computer. Angela walks in, finds Angela, uh, Darlene in her home and she's, you know, she's upset by this. She goes, how did you get into my place? And Darlene being the quick-witted person that she is says, you know, it was a penetration test, you failed. Uh, Angela's a bit miffed, you know, I haven't seen you in five weeks, and now all of a sudden you just kind of show up. And Darlene's, you know, doing her social engineering thing on Angela, and she's basically like, you know, kind of need your help right now. I need you, you know, Elliot needs your help. Um, we need you to kind of do this thing. And what I'm about to tell you, I want need you to tell yourself that this is very simple. No matter what kind of urge you have, what kind of whatever your gut is screaming at you, you need to tell yourself this is simple. And Darlene is basically saying, that, you know, I need you to take a device to work, and I need you to put it on the floor, and then I need you to walk away. And Angela was like, No, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to hack into the FBI. Are you crazy? And then Darlene lays it on her. You know, you're the one who put the CD in the all safe thing. Elliot was able to trace, cover your tracks and erase everything. But the FBI is investigating. You better hope that nobody else finds about it. You know, this is why Elliot needs to do this to make sure that doesn't happen. And Angela was like, you know, I'll, I'll take my chances. I'm not doing this. And that's when, you know, Darlene, of course, goes and meets with Elliot. That's when she tries to t convince Elliot to convince Angela to do this. And Elliot wants no part of it. Angela goes on and she ends up having a meeting with Ollie. Her no nothing, no good ex boyfriend in a bar. Um, he basically is trying to sweet talk her, you know, telling this is I guess is a favorite spot of theirs. Um, gives her his resume, you know, maybe she might have you know know of there be a way for him to get a job. They start talking a little bit, kind of reminiscing, and then he you know talks about Gideon. You know, how the person who did it was like a 5'9 truther or a Frank Cody type of a person. And then he, he asked kind of casually, do you think the, the CD had anything to do with the hack? Which was very not subtle on his part. And Angela just looks at him and then realizes that his phone's on the table and that he's possibly recording the conversation. She puts it into the, to the beer. She goes, are you working with the FBI? Uh, have you talked to the FBI? And, he, and Ollie was like, no, and then he says yes, and he says, you know, he gave a sketch to the C guy, about the C guy, but he never said any names. She doesn't believe him. She can be, couldn't believe this. He was saying, you know, his uncle was a lawyer, that he needed to do this. And then she, she kind of walks out. I think the best part of this is that, one, it reveals that Cisco's image is in the hands of the FBI. Ollie obviously said that Angela was responsible for... Uh, putting the CD into all safe and 
that Angela's getting really good at doing the whole um, smile bullshit thing. Like, when anybody tells her anything, just giving a smile and kind of bullshitting them, um, as she did with Ollie here in the entire conversation that they were having. So, this prompts Angela to, to basically meet with Elliot, and in this entire conversation she has with Elliot, she basically says, you know, I wasn't going to make the decision of whether or not she was going to do this until she saw him, because she knew that Elliot wouldn't lead her astray. He wouldn't have her do this unless he knew there was an absolute exit out, that there was no way she was going to get caught. And Elliot's a little shocked that she was there, but he was like, no, there, you know, he, ba he basically reassures her, you know, that there, that that's just not going to happen, but he's also like, you don't have to do this. And he goes, I want to do this. I need to do this. I need to be sure that what we're doing is going to make sure that this is all going to go away. And she basically breaks it down and is kind of slowly revealing that Angela's a very logical person. She basically breaks down the scenario, either I can go on the run, wait to be caught, or do something about it. And she's she's going to do something about it. She's going to do this. And she goes, besides, Angela says this, this is a simple task, which is very funny because, of course, it's not a simple task. But that's when they start having a conversation, and Angela's like, you know, I try to reach out to you. I try to talk to you, but you, you know, shunned me. And he was like, you know, you were there that day that was on the train station in the graveyard where I saw my, you know, my dead father. And, you know, I didn't want to meet you until I got this basically resolved. And that's when he tells her that he seen his dead father right behind her and she turns her head, which is such an, like I said earlier in the earlier story, like very empath empathetic thing that she did by turning and acknowledging basically Elliot's illness, if you will. And that's when she, you know, she smiles and she she basically tells him, you know, she's going to be there for him, you know, whatever he needs, whatever he wants, until, I guess, the moment when they can actually truly, really, you know, be together. So Angela, you know, is agreeing to to basically do this for F Society, which she doesn't know at the moment, but for Elliot. Uh cut back to Darlene. She is at the F Society's new hangout. She basically is passing off a task about the federal bailout to one of their guys, if you will, and puts him in charge. Uh, he There's an, a, a drone in the background. He's like, well, why aren't you going to be there? This is a big deal. She goes, well, I have to be somewhere else. This is very important. Um, putting you in charge. He says, I'm not going to do anything wrong. Darlene gets a call. Obviously, it must be from Elliot or maybe Angela. Another thing that's very interesting about it was that uh, Angela is going to meet up with F Society, and you can see in the background that all this trash is like piling up. There's a lot of people with F Society masks, and Angela is like switching cabs, taking subways, taking that subway, going up, going tags, taking another another cab, you know, walking to this place, doing all this like I guess covert ways to make sure that she is not being followed. And then she goes to Susan Jacobs' house, the new location of the F Society headquarters. And Darlene opens the door and asks, you know, where's your phone? And she goes at home. And, okay. So Darlene goes, okay, no bullshit. All cards on the table. And lets Angela in. And this is where Angela basically is being brought into F Society. She meets with, she sees Darlene. She sees Trenton. She sees Mosby. And... She's now being brought into the fold, if you will. So that's it for this, you know, particular episode. Like I said, I think it really moved a lot of the overall season two story arcs forward. Um, we're getting a little bit more about the Dark Army and their play. Uh, we now know that the Chinese servers are encrypted, just like the American eCorp servers. Angela is now part of F Society, if you will. They're going to go bug the FBI. Dom's team has been taken out, if you will, on the FBI. We don't know if she's com she's wounded or what the deal is, but she might be out of commission for a little bit, which might would put a delay in the F9. I think the F9 um, investigation, which might have been the whole purpose of the attack in the first place. 
we know that there's something happening. As once again, it's been mentioned about the bailout, this bailout that Philip Price and even White Rose have been trying to get to happen. The F Society is now trying to plan another another incident or another thing. It could be another hack. Uh, we're not sure what the event is going to be, but things are moving forward. Elliot has now in, is somehow in the hands of Ray. Um, not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think this is where it's going to come to a head, if you will, between him and Mr. Robot about who's going to be in control, if you will, because Elliot, again, is in a very sticky, sticky situation, and he might not be able to get himself out of it, and he might need Mr. Robot. But that's it for this review. I'm going to end this chat and then log in off. Thank you for joining us on this chat. You can find us on all podcast outlets such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, MixCloud, and any podcast catcher. You can reach us on Twitter at FSocietyIRC, our website at FSocietyIRC.xyz. You can email us at FSocietyIRC at ProtonMail.com. Our music attributes are under the Creative Commons license number three. The intro music is by Monk. The song is called The Planet Shakers, the Paragraph Remix. Our outro music is by Trevet Halbeka, and the song is Zelta Kappa, as well as Kwana, and the song is Demons. You can support the show either via the QR code in the show notes by contributing with a Bitcoin or through PayPal. And there's a link in the show notes where you can PayPal me under Hiroja Shai. If you're very into uh, cryptocurrency, you can also tip me through a uh, chain chip at Hiroja or at one name at Hiroja. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to hearing from you. Logging off. This has been a Hiroja Shad Space Odyssey Network production. <laughs>